Hi, my name is Stasha Gomenak. I am a retired neurologist, and now I practice as a sleep coach. I want to thank the IAOMT for inviting me to give this lecture. I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person. Um, unfortunately, I'm at a different conference, um, so I've pre-recorded this, but I'm hoping to be there for the question and answer sessions. And at the end, I'll be giving you my email and my website so that you can contact me if you have questions or if you're interested in further information. So this is a lecture about a little piece of the puzzle about sleep and why sleep disorders are common. This is not meant to be an exhaustive review and this will fit in with all the other interventions you're using medically and dentally to help your patients sleep better. It's a little tiny piece of the puzzle and it is about the brain and how the brain manages things while we're sleeping but it's not to minimize the importance of what you sleep dentists do to intervene for our patients. So the first question we should have is, why does everybody seem to have such terrible sleep? And I think that the answer from my point of view is it wasn't always this way. And looking at sleep in an evolutionary way over the last many thousands of years is an important part of the way I think about sleep. So I personally think that the epidemic of sleep disorders that includes all the way from insomnia to severe sleep apnea started when we moved indoors. So I've used this picture on the right and left to depict past in the 1950s and 60s, starting in the 1980s, there were several diseases that started to be increasing in incidence sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, irritable bowel. I believe that that is coincident with us moving indoors with the convergence of air conditioning, sunscreen, computers, et cetera. So we spend so much more time indoors than humans were meant to. All other animals remained outside except our pets. And since COVID hit, we live inside even more. So. These are the three important points that I promised you. So the three simple points to remember. The brain actually runs the oral airway while we're unconscious, while we're sleeping. So it's not called lie on the couch watching a movie apnea. It's called sleep apnea. So it's not that the anatomy is not important. It's that the anatomy changes and becomes paralyzed during certain phases of sleep. The second important point is that vitamin D has receptors in our sleep switches and it runs the sleep. And the third surprising point is that our microbiome, the intestinal bacteria run the sleep also. I'm gonna show you why I think these three points are important and how I stumbled into them. But if you have a low vitamin D, you also have the wrong microbiome. And now you have multiple deficiency states that come together as a cascade of events that changes the levels of your neurotransmitters that are supposed to be running the chemically run phases of sleep. Just to show you the logic of this, there are two important cycles of our planet. So we evolved here. One cycle that you know about already is the circadian cycle. It's a 24 hour cycle we're linked to sleeping at night. Not on it, all animals do that, but we do. And there's a linkage between sunlight entering the eye using retinoids like vitamin A, retina, those messages then move to the pineal and entrain our sleep to the 24 hour cycle of our planet. There's a second cycle that has been unfortunately overlooked, which is the 365 day annual cycle we also have systems that link us to sunlight, this time through our skin to making vitamin D that allows us to manage our metabolism, our fertility and our sleep to better survive long spans of time without food, i.e. winter. So we have two vitamins that actually link us through receptors in our brain sleep switches to planetary cycles. The one that we, over, that we overlooked, vitamin D. So why am I here? Why am I not from Stanford Sleep Center? I'm just practicing neurology in East Texas. Well, there was a series of 
serendipitous accidents that taught me a lot of things. And I'm gonna take you through that story because these are clinical observations. This is how all new ideas in medicine come about, is clinical observation. So the important part of it is I was doing regular neurology, half of my practice was in daily headache. I had young, healthy, otherwise completely normal young uh, women usually with daily headache. And one of those women, got better with a CPAP device. She actually insisted on getting a sleep study. I told her I didn't know anything about it. And she had severe sleep apnea, though she was not overweight. That doesn't seem so shocking now, but at that time, it was a big surprise. <clears throat> and the really surprising thing was she actually strapped on a CPAP device, even though her head hurt so much, she can't wear her hair in a ponytail and her headaches went away in a series of weeks. To me, because I'm biochemically based and I'm thinking about these drugs I'm using and the neurotransmitters that they're affecting, that didn't make any sense. One, those things are torture devices. Two, she strapped it on at night and she got better. So I then started to do sleep studies on all my daily headache sufferers because if you ask them, they'll admit that they're tired or that they have sleep problems, but that's not their primary focus. Their primary focus is, oh, I have three little kids. I'm not surprised that I don't sleep well. I have daily headache. That's why I'm coming to see the neurologist. But for five years, I did a lot of sleep studies. And most of the patients I was sending for sleep studies did not have sleep apnea, which was very confusing. So for someone who did have sleep apnea, I could give them a CPAP device. But if I didn't have sleep apnea, and I'm about to tell you what they did have, but all I had was sleeping pills. Now, over a series of years, it began to be obvious that they have a specific finding. So one, they didn't have apnea. They did not have drops in oxygen. Most of the explanations that have been supplied by the sleep experts are about getting a specific outcome, whether it's sympathetic overdrive or uh, hypertension or heart disease, it's drops in oxygen, then lead to stress, then lead to these diseases. But I'm actually studying people who I believe are in an earlier phase of this disease, which I also believe is progressive, and they didn't not have drops in oxygen and they weren't overweight. And the reports would say no significant apnea. But it turned out that after a little bit of discussion with my uh, pulmonologist who was reading these studies, they didn't have normal studies. They just didn't have significant apnea. So it turns out that what they usually had was reduced or no rapid eye movement sleep. So I was using sleeping pills recognizing that they really don't replace normal deep sleep, but why would they not be able to sleep in the first place? This is a healthy 32 year old. So then the question opens, if I'm seeing dramatic improvement in people who can use a CPAP device, but their sleep studies are inherently abnormal, no REM, reduced rapid eye movement sleep, REM related apnea, those things are not about the anatomy. There's no stopping breathing. Therefore, you can't look at the oral airway. Why would their REM sleep be different? Why would they have no REM? These are young, healthy people. So it asks questions that are beginning of seeking a way to get them better. But it's also prompts me to start reading articles about, well, how do we get into REM? And where does that happen in the brain? And oh, by the way, this is neurology. This is not pulmonology. This is not dentistry. This is about how the brainstem sleep switches actually function. How do they do it normally? So we can look for why would they be malfunctioning? So I had by this time at the end of four or five years been now doing sleep studies in all comers. Anybody would let me, kids with epilepsy, kids with headache, people with strokes over the, the weekend that I met in the hospital. So all comers were getting sleep studies because it was becoming obvious to me that sleep is the primary healing of all human beings. Our drugs are a band-aid. I, if I could get to sleep better and I can make headaches better, then I should be able to get vertigo better. I should be able to get epilepsy better. These are all genetic diseases that are about hyper excitability of certain neurons. And that's in fact what I was seeing, you know, so hypothetical and then seeing people cure things that I really didn't have medicines to fix them with before began to inspire me to really learn a lot more about sleep. 
one of the most important comments that my pulmonologist made when I asked him why, why would they have REM related apnea? Like, why would it happen only then? And he said, well, because we get the most paralyzed of all in, in REM sleep. And I frankly didn't even know that we got paralyzed. So I was quite new to this information at the beginning of this. And as soon as he said, we get the most paralyzed, I thought, well, that's creepy. We're gonna die. I mean, apnea is about stopping breathing, but we get completely paralyzed, really? And it turns out that the oral pharynx only gets paralyzed in REM. It doesn't get paralyzed in the other phase of deep sleep called slow wave sleep. So then I started to read about how do we get paralyzed? Because this implies if our brain stem that is extremely old and the dinosaurs had the same brain stem organization that we do, they're reptiles, but this is called the reptilian brain for a reason. The organization, the connections between the clumps of neurons, the neurotransmitters that are used, we get paralyzed. If the dinosaurs dominated the planet longer than we were, they got paralyzed and then they woke up and they could move again. This is an extraordinarily old system. And if we just look around to the fact that it's only humans wearing the sleep apnea devices, and that that's just the tip of the iceberg, that's the worst possible, most severely affected patients that we discovered first, what if this is an epidemic around the globe happening in humans in the last 40 years, which is what I believe, what went wrong? Because this has been working perfectly for literally 500 million years. So just to give you a demonstration of what we usually see when we do a sleep study that shows sleep apnea, this is a mock-up to show you what we're measuring when we put electrodes on a person who's at an, over, at an overnight sleep study center. You see here that the airflow has stopped. There's an increase in effort from the chest wall and the abdomen suggesting that the patient is trying to breathe in. And this points us to this obstruction in the airway. But the tech doesn't run in and say, Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, you stop breathing. What you see on the recording is that there is an arousal of the brain. This means we have always been getting paralyzed in certain phases of sleep. And for us to design the brain that way, there must be a method of supervision. So we think we're all cool because we have these little electrodes that we put on for the supervised sleep study. But in actual fact, the brain has always known whether there was air flowing. It has sensory input from here. It always knows whether or not the chest wall is moving. That means it has a fallback supervisor that is waking the patient to light sleep every time apnea happens. That means this was designed with those options in mind. It just wasn't supposed to happen 60 times an hour. It was supposed to happen every once in a while when things weren't going well. Now, the next question is, because this is so old, it prompts us to think that there's something that happened in the last 40 years to make this different. And by the way, I'm still operating in the toxin, bad food, eat wrong mindset that is currently being sold to us because I don't know anything else. And I'm looking for toxins, but I'm looking for them, chemical effects in a brainstem where I now start to read about what is it that actually controls our paralysis. So there are these sleep switches, so-called, um, that are in the posterior brainstem. Uh, they are in, near the periaqueductal gray. And those switches actually govern paralysis and clock functions. The nucleus pontus reticularis oralis caudalis governs the paralysis function. The clock is quite close to that. It's in the locus ceruleus and the substantia nigra. And those nuclei are all interlocking. That means they're supposed to turn on and off together. When we do that in a neurology setting, it's done with electricity, but it's done in a slightly different way, way than the electrons moving in the walls. So when I'm trying to produce a steady state, so what we're supposed to be doing with these brainstem sleep switches is providing a perfect paralysis, completely paralyzed, but not collapsing the airway, 
completely paralyzed, not kicking our legs, not contracting the muscles. When you think about it, if these nuclei control our ability to get paralyzed, they must be able to activate the muscles also. That means they can contract those same muscles. That means they also have a measurement of what's the tone. So those nuclei are synced to the sensory fibers that are telling the brain how much tension is in the muscles, both the oral pharynx and the rest of the body. And I start to come up with this idea that, oh, when we hold my arm out in neurology and keep it in one place, what's actually happening there is I've got to move the arm up message that's happening at a certain firing rate. And I move the arm down message that's happening at a certain firing rate. And if I have a tremor, I'm actually getting a bit of a wobble. The firing rate is moving. So I come up with this idea because I'm reading these nerdy science articles about this guy who's putting these hair-like electrodes in these single dopaminergic pacemaker cells in the brainstem. And he's watching the firing rate of those while the rat is sleeping. And he's dropping neurotransmitters on there. And he drops epinephrine or norepinephrine or acetylcholine or GABA. And he watches the firing rate. And he watches the firing rate change with these neurotransmitters. So what occurs to me is, okay, this is really a way to look at these many diseases as being on a continuum. So apnea means I got too paralyzed. Periodic limb movements of sleep means I didn't get paralyzed enough. And by the way, they're periodic because they're walking movements. We have these old ancient walking nuclei that are into this same area of the brainstem that are inappropriately activated. They're not being paralyzed or suppressed appropriately. And I start to think of it like that. So I'm now thinking about sleep switches on a single cell, in a single cell way, and I'm thinking of them on a neurotransmitter basis, moving the neurotransmitters incorrectly. So this now enlarges my thinking. So I had been in the same, only the airway can be doing this, but I have lots of patients who have insomnia. The same complaint, daily headache, three kids, insomnia. That's not an airway problem. So now I'm thinking about it as two possible origins. And then here's what happens. One of my 18 year olds with daily headache this is after five years of sleep studies uh, that I'm seeing all these patients and I'm watching what happens to them. And I'm watching for what could be going wrong in this very basic, very old, the, the primary control of our body rests in this ability to sleep. This 18 year old has a terrible looking sleep study. She had daily headache, her headaches went away with rapamil, but her sleep study shows absolutely no deep sleep. Her complaint was not her sleep. She slept for 10 or 11 hours. But we recorded then 11 hours of her having no deep sleep and arousing 35 times an hour. She never gets into deep sleep. She never stops breathing. There are no drops in oxygen. And by chance, she said, I'm so tired. And I said, that's not my job, but you know, let's do some tired labs. And she had a B12 deficiency that was noticeable enough that I even I noticed it in the 170 range. So at that point, because I'm thinking in a single cell way and I'm thinking about pacemaker cells, I'm thinking, you know, I have some patients in the hospital right now with stroke and they're in their early 40s and they have B12 deficiency and they have AFib. And you know, those pacemaker cells in the heart are just like the pacemaker cells in the head. Is it possible that those pacemaker cells that have to fire their whole life since the day they were formed, they never stop, that they get B12 deficient. So I'm thinking of it in a totally different way. So I start drawing B12 levels. And ironically, when you go to Google and you say B12 symptoms, it says chronic fatigue, um, daily headache. And I know I had never done a B12 level for daily headache supper. It's not written that way in the neurology literature. It's written under B12 deficiency, but it's not written as you have daily headache. What are the things we should look for? Just like sleep. At that time, sleep was not listed as one of the as one of the primary motivators of having a daily headache syndrome. So for over a period of four months, I started to do B12 levels on all the patients who have daily headache and a sleep study. And I'd only had partial success with CPAP devices and sleeping pills. I'm really not getting where I wanna be. I already know that most of the medicines that I've used for daily headache or sleep, they wear off after a few years. So. One, the B12 was the beginning of that, but one of my clients or one of my patients suggested that uh, her doctor had done her vitamin D level 
and her D level was low and her doctor gave her vitamin D and her wrist pain went away. There was another observation in the same young, healthy population that I didn't think was appropriate. 32 year olds who exercise and diet is not an issue for them. They've been doing paleo, they're doing everything they can to have peak performance. And yet they have knee pain or they have ankle pain or back pain. And it just seemed to me that there were these so many young, healthy females that had inappropriate pain. So I began to think about the fact that if they don't get paralyzed correctly, there has to be a reason why we get paralyzed. Maybe the moving parts get paralyzed to repair. That means if I don't get completely paralyzed in my legs, then maybe this chronic injury that happens as I use my legs during the day never gets a chance to repair. So we've been focusing all on what we're doing while we're awake, not focusing at all at what happens to my repair phase. So now I'm interested in that. And this gal says, you know, my doctor gave me vitamin D and my wrist pain went away. And I'm really not the least bit interested in vitamins. So I wasn't interested, but I was drawing blood anyway. So over a period of four months, I'm drawing B12s and D levels. And it turns out that not all the B12s were low. The really, really sick ones had low B12s, but everybody's D was low. Now that's not surprising to you because D deficiency is as common as cell phone use at this time. But the thing that was interesting about that is I happened by accident to be measuring the D when it should be at its highest at the end of August to December, when we make it all our D from sun exposure. I knew nothing about D. And then I had two patients come back in and say, hey, you wrote to me and told me that my D was low and you told me to get some vitamin D. And I did that in about three weeks, my sleep got better and my headaches went away. And these were two men who had higher D levels than it turns out the women did. They were also on CPAP, so they had additional help. But they came back with a clinical observation that vitamin D affected my sleep, which I thought was very weird. But that led me to some interesting articles. A search in PubMed in 2009 at Christmas time had no hits, vitamin D and sleep, because there were no articles at that time. But if you put in vitamin D in the brain, what I got to was this guy, Walter Stump, who back in the 1980s had written that there were vitamin D receptors in the nucleus pontus reticularis oralis caudalis, the same nucleus that I was looking at for paralysis. He's already reported that it's in the sleep switches. Now, why don't I know that? That's kind of creepy. Okay, it turns out he has already published over a 30 year span, 300 articles describing where the vitamin D receptors are throughout the body. This doesn't sound too weird now, but he was having a very difficult time getting all the other vitamin D experts to adhere to his point of view as to what D was about. And unfortunately, they're still having a hard time with it. But there are vitamin D receptors in the pituitary, which means that D is able to dial changes in our fertility through those fertility hormones, our metabolism and things like insulin and whether or not we put on fat in the winter. And it is controlling whether we hibernate or not. So I actually called Walter Stump and said, hey, you publish all these articles. I just had this clinical observation that all my patients who have terrible sleep horrible looking sleep studies, no rapid eye movement sleep. Has anyone written about D in sleep? And he said, no, but that's perfectly logical because it's linked to hibernation. So he's already published very intelligent articles showing that the cycle that I gave you at the beginning of this lecture manages multiple hormonal adjustments so we can survive the winter. So together, Walter and I published an article uh, and that was on my, my actual clinical observation. So the next question would be, okay, if D manages hibernation, is there a vitamin D blood level, not a vitamin D dose? Is there a blood level that may actually contribute to sleeping better? Because my patients are desperate. I'm desperate. I've tried a bunch of drugs and CPAP. And basically we're looking for something else. We're looking for a deficiency state that we could perhaps give back. So over a, a span of two years, I'm giving about a thousand people vitamin D in various doses to maintain a blood level that would give them better sleep. And I'm listening to what they say. We don't have sleep trackers at this time. So they come back and say, I'm sleeping better. Okay. So these are some pretty new ideas. You're not going to have a lot of people around you that have 
acknowledge the link between D and sleep. So keep in mind, these are very new ideas, but I wanna open the possibility that then we might be able to intervene in all sorts of things. So the first thing to know is, I believe that these movement related sleep disorders are on a continuum that if you continue to have a low D and you lose your microbiome, there are several chemical deficiencies that contribute to your neurotransmitter mix being abnormal. The next important thing to know is once you look at the anatomy of the posterior brainstem, it turns out that the neurons are clumped in a certain way that is organized around sleep. So you only paralyze the oral pharynx in REM sleep. That opens up all these other possibilities and you look at it in a totally different way. That means, oh, if you paralyze the bulbar muscles, you get sleep apnea or REM related apnea. If you paralyze the chest wall and the diaphragm, which you are also seeing on your sleep studies that you do that say some sleep apnea and some central apnea, it's all, it's all apnea and it's all central. It's on a measure of degree. So once your patient has central apnea, this is clearly now in the neurology, but that means that there may be a deficiency state in the background for that also. And that these on a continuum would allow us to fix the anatomy, but also fix the physiology in the brain. So this also includes people who have been completely overlooked, which means the people with insomnia. These sleep switches are things that run automatically. This is not a voluntary state. Sleep comes on you and it overtakes you. That means someone who doesn't have the right neurochemistry to fall asleep has insomnia. And we'll, all we have is to offer them medicine. So instead, I've broken these sleep studies, sleep disorders into a different way of looking at it, which then opens all sorts of possibilities because most patients have little bits of both of these. Now, it turns out that sleep disorders are everywhere since the 1980s. We have parallel articles that show all the same people with sleep disorders also have vitamin D deficiency. And when repair stops, when you stop sleeping into deep sleep, you start aging faster. So as I told you, Walter and I uh, put together his scientific evidence and my clinical observations. And in 2012, we published the only article, it's still there, unfortunately, that was an accidental prospective trial of managing blood levels of D. And that is not a simple undertaking. It was not a specific dose. Importantly, it was not a fixed dose. It was whatever dose each individual needs to achieve and maintain a specific blood level. And it was not hard to measure. My patients came back, especially migraineurs, are very sensitive to what their REM sleep is doing because migraine is actually linked dry, directly to what the REM sleep is doing. So a vitamin D blood level of 60 to 80 nanograms per mil was the level that maintained and initiated better sleep. And that was able to be documented for a good two years. Now, here's the more important part of the lecture. And that is when you give vitamin D and you do not bring back the microbiome, very bad things are gonna happen to your patients. And I'm telling you this emphatically because the whole globe is starting to take vitamin D for COVID prevention. If you do not know how to bring the microbiome back with it, very bad things happen. I know it because I experienced it and my patients experienced. So these are the things that came after doing vitamin D and thinking I got it all figured out. No problem, 60 to 80 will just stay there. Everything will be fixed. The sleep got better, but not all things went away. So two years of vitamin D, irritable bowel syndrome did not go away. That suggests that even though we now know in 2020, the first article is showing, I had hypothesized that D must be a growth factor to the microbiome, but I really did, couldn't find any articles for that. So it wasn't until 2020 that there was a manipulation of the D supply that then measured what the species were in the, in the uh, GI tract. But importantly, vitamin D by itself, even staying at 60 to 80, even though it made the sleep better, it did not take away irritable bowel syndrome, which suggests that adding D back to the microbiome is not enough to bring back the normal four phyla that we need to be normal humans. Second important thing was pain got a little better at the beginning, but then began to worsen by the end of the second year. 
There are many patients that you are seeing that have chronic pain that are related to this and they did not lose weight. That's really important. They were exercising more, they felt better, they slept better, they had more energy, but they did not lose weight. Now, here's what happened. My patients started to come back and say things like, you know, I came to you with daily headache and now they're telling me I have rheumatoid arthritis. Like, what up? And because I'm doing something that's really out there, still is, trying to maintain a certain blood level, clearly the D effect is failing now. Our sleep was better, now it's worse again. I'm desperate, I don't know why. And a couple of uh, women in their 40s wander in within a month of each other saying their hands and feet are burning. That is extremely unusual. It is becoming more common, but I'm a neurologist and neuropathy is my subspecialty. So I'm completely aware that uh, unfortunately it may well be that I've induced something, that I've actually pushed them into a vitamin deficiency state, which is very unsettling. So the question is, what do I do now? I'm now thinking as I make the more repairs by sleeping into deep sleep, I'm not just inducing unconsciousness. I want to induce more repairs. Well, when we make more repairs, we use more B vitamins. Again, I'm not an expert in any vitamins, but burning in the hands and feet usually connotes B12 deficiency, both of these gals are already on B12, so I know it's not B12, but it has a real B vitamin ring to it. So I'm desperate, we're all sleeping badly. I happen to have this peculiar buttock pain where I can't sit down at the end of the day, which is weird. And a woman walks in the door with this book for me. I personally am very skeptical about vitamins, so it takes her about a couple months for me to read it, but it turns out that this was a pivotal thing that she walked in with. She brought it to me because this lay person, Eisenstein, who published this, was giving pantothenic acid, a B vitamin called B5, to lay people with rheumatoid arthritis, showing that their pain got better and their sleep got better, which is why the patient brought it to me. So not only does she say that B5 makes cortisol, which is a logical link to autoimmune disease and inflammatory pain, but I go to the references that come with this book. And these references are from the 1950s and they have not been repeated, but they block pantothenic acid and show that within two weeks, the small groups that they did this in had four things. They had a puppet-like gait, burning in the hands and feet, belly complaints and insomnia. Well, I've got a couple of with burning in their hands and feet. So I run out. I get 500, 400 of pantothenic acid. And while I'm standing there in the health food store, I think, you know, all I remember from medical school, and I've already just screwed up a bunch of people D. I don't know anything about the B vitamins. But what I remember is if you give one B, you should give all of them. So I pick up this stuff called B100 because it's already sitting on the shelf. It is a known amount. It is non-proprietary. It doesn't matter who makes it. It has 100 milligrams of all the different B vitamins or 100 micrograms, except for folic acid, which is 400. So for a period of only one week, <coughs> because there was a disastrous outcome, I recommended, I took myself and I recommended to these same patients who came back with, I've been on D for two years, but now I have pain, with a recommendation of 400 milligrams of B5 and B100. Now, here's what happened. I actually did the same thing they were doing. And within a few days, I started to have restless legs all day long. So my sleep disorder is restless legs and it's controlled, beautifully controlled, it's only a drowsiness. I hardly ever have it. And within a few days, I noticed I'm starting to have restless legs all day, all night. And then my patients start to trickle back in. So there's about 40 people I gave this recommendation to and about 30 out of 40 came back and yelled at me. And unlike what, it says in the book that I was given and all the other references that says 400 milligrams is the right thing to do. They said, this stuff nearly killed me, the 400 milligrams. I was so agitated and I couldn't sleep. Several of them did what I did. So when the restless legs came on, I took out the 400 milligrams of pantothenic acid thinking, this is just like the D. All this vitamin literature is so sloppy. There's an important dose effect. And I'm obviously on too big a dose. I get down to B100 by itself and my pain goes away in a day. My sleep gets better. It was very weird. A few people who came back fired me because they felt I should know this, even though I'm doing exactly what it says in the literature. 
And several of them stopped the 400 milligrams of penafinic acid, just continued on B100, and their pain went away and their sleep got better right away. I thought it was the weirdest thing I've ever seen. It still freaks me out. I've been doing this now for nearly 10 years, but it's still weird. Now, that means that not only did D make the sleep better, but B5 is doing something that's different in my patients. Why would 400 milligrams of panathenic acid be sitting on the shelf? Why would they recommend that dose? When it's clear that my patient group, the only thing that's different about them I maintain is that their D level is much higher than other people, like the people with rheumatoid arthritis, their D level is different. It's almost like the B5 is synergistic in some way with D. And if you get them both right, you get better sleep and more, almost no pain. That burning pain in the two gals went away in two days. So it was clear that it was related to the B5. But there's some questions prompted here. Why did it, I and other people start to be induced to making new symptoms that appear to be B vitamin deficiency symptoms. And why did it take two years? There was no change in diet. So is it possible that sleeping better, they use more bees, that they depleted their stores of bees? We've been told that there are no stores of bees. That turns out to be a frank lie. There are scientific articles that show that B1, B5, B6 all have documented stores. We don't know where they are, but it also means that the blood level measurement is worthless. This observation suggests that we use up our, some of our B vitamin stores. Now, because they come as an eight pack, and we're gonna talk about why, I start to read about them. And the first article, review article I pull up, which is by Hamid Saeed, talks about the fact that riboflavin has a colonic bacteria source, thiamine has a colonic bacteria source and a food source. All of the B vitamins have a bug microbiome source, but no one was willing to step up and say, you know, maybe the bugs make all the bees. Like, why would we have any things called bee in the first place? So the first question would be, oh, maybe they got bee deficient because the primary source is really their microbiome. And I know that their bellies are all screwed up because they have IBS. And by now we're thinking, oh, IBS means they have the wrong microbiome. But we still don't have a good answer for the IBS. We're giving lots of probiotics. I was personally spending 60 bucks a month on the probiotics, but they don't work. Otherwise you do it for one month and the bugs would grow back and they would be self-sustaining for our whole life the way they were designed to be. So the first question was, is it possible that the microbiome has gone bad and that they are really, when the phyla are correct, that they are the source of the B vitamins? Why didn't two years of D bring the bacteria back? What else could those little bugs want and my first conclusion was, oh, is it possible that the normal four phyla, so at this time, my husband happens to hand me an article about in the Economist Journal, which is a, actually in a financial journal about very general, uh, potentially money-making ideas about the microbiome. And now they're publishing all these great things. This is about 2013 saying, you know, if you do a gastric bypass on a mouse and then you take the resulting bacteria from that mouse's poops and you put it in another mouse, the second mouse loses weight. That means what really governs our weight loss is the population of the microbiome. What really makes the difference probably in making bees is the population. And that same article says we have four specific phyla that actually spontaneously result in the baby's that are three months old who are in outside living circumstances around the globe using mom's breast milk. So the D is coming from the mom's breast milk because they live outside and the D is high enough to pass it to the baby. And then the D is establishing which phyla of bacteria become the dominant bacteria. Okay, well then that might mean that this B100 I'm giving my patients is actually providing a B vitamin soup and now Mr. who needs thiamine from his buddy, who's now piles of poop away. So I get this idea that one, vitamin D did not bring back the microbiome. I know that it for a fact because my patients got worse and worse. D by itself didn't bring them back. But what if there were just piles of the wrong bacteria in between? And what if we now make it a D plus all Bs soup? Because this four, foursome are actually a symbiotic foursome 
of bacteria that trade bees within that foursome. So what actually happens was that theory is correct. What I told my patients was, oh, I'm thrilled that your pain and your sleep is better now that you're taking this B100, but I'm worried that the combination is gonna bring back the normal bacteria. And when they come back, they were always the primary source of these eight chemicals. That's where there's eight things called B. They were always coming from the poop bacteria. Those eight chemicals were actually originally purified out of yeast and a bacterial mixture that we use to make beer and bread. And that mixture was used to grow bacteria. That means that way back in 1920, 1930, the bees were something we describe first as bacterial growth factors. They're all bacteria growth factors. So the original liquid that is just what we use to make bread, we put yeast in there that makes D2, and then we set it on the counter, we leave it there in a nice warm temperature, not too hot, not too cold. And then what we're doing is growing the bacteria that comes out of the water and the air, and we're specifically favoring species that like B, and they make B vitamins. Then we poured them in the Petri dish, we grew bacteria, and we learned when we isolated these chemicals from that liquid, that they would promote the growth of certain bacteria. Well, then the idea of vitamins came. Okay, now the fascinating part of this is we have 200 species that live in our belly that we know of by their DNA footprints, but they haven't been grown in a Petri dish, probably because we didn't know that they needed D as a cofactor. This was just published in 2020. So we're gonna start to see articles talking about which specific bacteria make certain B vitamins. I'm not the first one to describe that the microbiome makes B vitamins and that likely that that was the primary source. There's another group that published that the year before I did. But that means that a D-related microbiome change also results in B deficiency. This is where it gets really important for you and what you see in your patients. So in 2016, I published a hypothesis that we connected D level, microbiome, microbiome bees. And there are other, other labs that are publishing that now. There's just one out of Japan last year. D to the microbiome, microbiome to B6 production, B6 production to dopamine. So there were connect the dots. And there are several things that you can notice when the bees are wrong. Sleep is only one of them. Increase in inflammation is the other really important that we're gonna bring together as a package in a minute. So. The bees absolutely impact sleep. They also impact your medical dental practice in many ways. The microbiome of the mouth is really a continuation of the microbiome of the GI tract. Now the dental literature is suggesting you have certain species of bacteria in your mouth, you get dental caries. If you have a together D deficiency in the wrong microbiome, you're much higher risk for periodontal disease early. So, there are also effects on the autonomic nervous system. And it was actually the sleep dentist who taught me about heart rate variability and how the autonomic nervous system is different during the day in people who have sleep apnea. And we're gonna wind up talking about COVID. This next part is something you're only gonna see here. It's one of the most important parts of this lecture. You're gonna learn how B5 deficiency is linked to acetylcholine levels. If you wanna learn more about this, there are courses that I give that get, teach you about it more in depth. But first you wanna know why, why would I be interested? Okay, so B5 is completely overlooked. You won't read anything about it because here's the current dogma. Pathetic acid deficiency doesn't exist because it's in every food. That turns out to be a lie. It turns out that coenzyme A, this entire molecule is in every food. But the bacteria do not break it down and use the panathenic acid that's part of the backbone. It turns out they make it from raw materials. And it turns out B5 is not in any food. It's only made by the gut bacteria and B5 deficiency absolutely exists all around us in anyone who has the wrong microbiome and therefore does not have the proper supply coming from the bacteria. B5, we know a lot about, we know about the pump that pumps it in, it pumps it in at the GI tract, pumps it in at the brain. That pump is very specific. This is a molecule that's chiral. It comes in a right-handed form and a left-handed form. It only recognizes the right-handed form. 
And it actually pumps in three things, B5, alpha-lipoic acid, and biotin. Then the B5 goes up into the brain and makes coenzyme A. Now, coenzyme A is used to make 100 things in our body. That's an interesting thing because my patients only presented with certain complaints. So we're going to talk about that, but there are a lot of, there's a lot of detail in the background. So the part that I knew about from that book that was brought to me was the coenzyme A in the adrenal makes cortisol, which does attach to autoimmunity and inflammatory pain. But it turns out that as trying to give these lectures, I felt that I needed to figure out a little bit better why my patients came back and said, this stuff here made me so revved up I couldn't sleep at all. So it's acting like a drug. It's acting like amphetamine. This is an innocent vitamin that's never supposed to hurt us. 30 of my patients come back and say, this stuff nearly killed me. That means it's going right in up to the brain and making a neurotransmitter, just like my drugs. So that's creepy and it's dangerous. That's one of the reasons why it's clear that it's not in any food. Now, through a series of articles, it becomes obvious that what acetylcholine, what makes coenzyme A makes in the brain is acetylcholine. Now, the weird part about that is I'm a neurologist and I'm supposed to know these neurotransmitters. You could be excused if you were a dentist and you didn't know about acetylcholine. Now, most of us would know that the neuromuscular junction uses acetylcholine as the neurotransmitter. But I really couldn't think of what it was that acetylcholine was doing in the brain. I knew it was like deficient in dementia. And I began to realize that most of the things that I know about neurotransmitters are formed in my head not from the pharmacology textbook, but the effects of the drugs that I get. So if I use a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, they get happy. If I use dopamine, it's for Parkinson's disease. But I didn't have any drugs for acetylcholine, which is fascinating. There are no drugs for acetylcholine. Oh, except nicotine. So in your primary pharmacology classes, you learn that acetylcholine has nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors. And oddly, the patients with Parkinson's disease who smoked always did better. That was still in the literature, many observations. They always wondered about that. So in the background, it turns out that acetylcholine deficiency states of the brain and the autonomic nervous system are all over the place. We just haven't recognized them partially because we don't have a drug that we feel comfortable giving. And secondly, because we have missed this connection between the microbiome and acetylcholine levels in the nervous system. So it turns out that there's actually an article using Walter Stump's original observations in the nucleus reticularis pontus oralis condalis, the sleep switches that make us paralyzed. Another lab used his observation and said, oh, there are vitamin D receptors in those cells. I wonder what happens when the vitamin D hits the receptor. So in all hormones, the hormone hits a receptor, that receptor then changes the configuration of the DNA and a certain protein is expressed and it's variable from organ to organ. And they'd actually gone through the steps to show that when vitamin D hits that receptor in that particular nucleus, what it expresses is choline acetyltransferase, which is the final enzyme depicted here in making acetylcholine. Now, remember that I told you that I thought there was a synergistic effect between B5 and D. So it turns out my patients have been taking D for two years. They've got boatloads of this choline acetyltransferase sitting all over the place in their sleep switches. And then all of a sudden I give them a huge dose of B5, which then turns into acetyl-CoA. So the choline acetyltransferase is looking for its raw materials. B5 is necessary to make acetyl-CoA. So now they're still deficient in acetylcholine, still not sleeping well, despite our D intervention. And that means that these two chemicals are actually synergistic for the production of acetylcholine. Now, why would you care? What does it do? Why is it important? If you just type in into Google acetylcholine, what you'll get in these huge animal textbooks that are not in the sleep, human sleep textbooks, is that acetylcholine governs our level of alertness and our ability to focus during the day and our ability to sleep at night, both get paralyzed and to transition through the various sleep phases. Now it's odd that we're not talking about acetylcholine all the time as our sleep lectures. Frontal acetylcholine, specifically at nicotinic receptors, governs our ability to concentrate. So is it just by coincidence that all our kids have ADD and ADHD in the same time frame over the last four years. No, it's not a coincidence. 
it's now well worked out that they have acetylcholine deficiency. Also, this is a very simplified diagram of the neurotransmitters used to get us paralyzed and acetylcholine is a major player in that. Importantly for the things that you know about putting in mouthpieces, oral appliances, the connection between doing that and intervening in the mouth, there is a very important thing to know about acetylcholine and the autonomic nervous system. We know a lot about the fact that patients are always in too high sympathetic tone. We have imagined that it's the sleep disorder that caused that or the increased stress of our life, but we might be able to picture it in a slightly different way. So all the interventions that we do, including putting in oral appliances, crank up the parasympathetic tone. We know that parasympathetic is called rest and digest. That means it makes you calm during the day and it makes you allowed, it makes you able to sleep at night. That means what if we lost the bugs that make the B5 and we have B5 low and D low, and that means we don't really have the neurotransmitter that's needed for the parasympathetic side. What would that look like? So here's what the parasympathetic does. It slows the heart rate, decreases blood pressure, encourages GI motility. And as soon as you read through that, I realized these are my patients, 32 years old, had a couple of kids, no other medical problems, sitting on the examining table with a heart rate of 110, saying that she feels like her stomach is full eight hours after she eats, okay? And she's also being treated with anti-anxiety medicine. So what would we see in our population? Well, exactly what we see. We've just pictured it as being, oh, you're in fight flight all the time. But if there's a deficiency state, I can intervene in a different way, which is would be really welcomed by everybody who's tried everything that everybody's told them about diet and exercise and meditation, et cetera. We also have extensive literature that documents heart rate variability, i.e., what's the state of sympathetic versus parasympathetic tone that shows in multiple disease states. We have done these measurements already. We know that everybody that's failing has increased sympathetic tone. So I wanna give you just a few flashes of other acetylcholine deficiency states that have now been well-documented. The first one is ADD, ADHD. This guy actually comes to the end and says, we really shouldn't be giving methamphetamine. Methamphetamine works in the adrenergic system, epinephrine, norepinephrine. We, they are really deficient in acetylcholine. And I get to that and I think, you know, there's no way I'm gonna convince these moms to give their kid a cigarette to smoke at recess. It's not gonna happen. But instead, we can focus on why don't we get the natural supply of acetylcholine instead of giving a nicotine as an acetylcholine agonist or mimicker, why don't we get their belly bacteria and give them back to where they should be and give them their natural source of acetylcholine. Parkinson's disease, probably some, not all, have 10 or 15 years of an acetylcholine deficiency state that precedes the dopamine deficiency state. We've always had Parkinsonian symptoms, especially postural tremor, head tremor, some of the dystonias, they are acetylcholine deficiency states that are linked to the D microbiome deficiency combination. They're actually using nicotine as patches for autistic kids now, and there will soon be studies done nicotine patches for kids with ADD, ADHD, both in animal models and in humans. And here's a really important piece that reflects what we're seeing in COVID. There's a new pathway where acetylcholine is not being used as a neurotransmitter. It's actually being used in the body sort of as a hormone. And I'm gonna take you to the graphic because I think it's easier to understand. So because they started doing vagus nerve stimulation in people with uh, epilepsy originally, and then for other things, they noticed that the vagus nerve stimulation led to a change in T cells. So there's a direct line from the vagus to the spleen. The spleen then releases T cells that then release choline acetyltransferase. So these are T cells, they're not nerve cells. So this is called the acetylcholine anti-inflammatory pathway because these T cells that are released then go into the tissues, both in the blood and the, and the soft tissues, and then they release choline acetyltransferase. Well, that stuff is sitting there looking for B5 and choline. That means some of the things that I had seen that I didn't expect and were kind of scary 
was if you continue that B50 or B100 too long, you can get hives or eczema or new onset of psoriasis. So there was a clear connection minute to minute in the inflammatory system and the dose of B5 that you're giving, and it's probably through this pathway. And are they affecting our level of immunity and the current COVID epidemic? It is my belief that they are. So there is a unfortunate confluence of several things that have come together to mean that we've been focusing on what happens when you get COVID, but really we should be focusing on what's the state of the person who is exposed. We can find out that they actually got exposed, but they have no symptoms. An asymptomatic carrier that implies that their immune system did perfectly. You didn't even get a symptom. Then we should say, is that, does that mean that everybody else has a less than ideal immune system? And why? Why do they have that around the globe? There are multiple things getting the front page that point in this direction. So just to preface that, vitamin D affects immunity directly in multiple ways. The microbiome affects immunity. It turns out the microbiome actually makes the raw materials that make the endocannabinoids in our body and the endocannabinoids affect immunity and inflammation. These are what have gotten to the front page. Obesity, which really basically means you have the wrong microbiome. You have the winter microbiome that encourages your body, no matter what you eat, to get fatter and fatter. Darker skin color, which prevents you from making vitamin D in the same amount of time that a lighter skin person other chronic illness, which means you have a sleep disorder and low vitamin D levels all point in the same way. Sleep disorder and goofed up immune system. So pantothenic acid, the microbiome, coenzyme A, acetylcholine all converge in various mechanisms to make the person who has a bad outcome actually kill themselves. So right now we're being told that cytokine storm is what makes the person die. It's not the infection itself, it's the poorly functioning immune system that actually kills the patient. So the most important thing I want you to remember is using D over several years, doesn't matter what the dose is. You could start on 2000 and take it for 10 years. When you finally get a D level that's into the 60 or 80 range and your body starts to sleep better, even if it's not perfect, and it starts to make more repairs, if you do not normalize the microbiome, you will start to have B deficiency disorders that will make your situation worse. So B plus B5 equals return of the microbiome. I have a whole course that teaches you how to understand this and using it in other people and how to do it yourself. But this is pivotal because the pain that results from having D on board, and it may result five years later, we're just gonna give you a neuropathic pain medicine and not ever make the connection to this time-linked progression of events. So normal immunity, also repair of autoimmunity, which also potentially means repair of poor or inadequate development during childhood, requires normal sleep, normal bees, normal microbiome, normal D levels over time to maintain your sleep. I have seen autoimmune disorders reverse themselves over a span of years by keeping the sleep better over time. It is not the vitamins that repair people. It is normal sleep that repairs disease. So COVID results, catch the virus, no disease, normal immune system. Kids at the moment catch the disease initially, don't look so bad, but are increasing risk of autoimmune disease afterwards. Unfortunately, I believe that we're going to see the same problems with the immune system, whether it's vaccination or actual exposure to the virus, because our bad outcomes, the anti-vaxxers are not crazy. They see something happen to their child. That means we're giving vaccinations to human beings that look normal, but they do not have a normal immune system because their D is low and their microbiome is wrong. That means the results of vaccinations that we use safely for 40 years have changed. They're changing in the same COVID environment as well. So putting it all together, it has always been the case that we made vitamin D on our skin when we lived outdoors. So when we make our D on our skin, as we get old, so our original design was 
if you don't starve to death, if you're not killed in war or by an epidemic of viral or bacterial disease, you can live to be 75 and really not see the doctor. And then your D starts to go down and then you lose your microbiome over a series of years. And then you start to have medical problems. That means this was always there in the background, but it was part of aging. So these are all diseases that exist in old people. We just thought it was about old people. When you get old, and it's not that old people need less sleep, old people always develop a sleep disorder if they live long enough, and that is part of when they're about to die. They either fall asleep during the day or they have insomnia or they have sleep apnea. Why do their teeth fall out? Because D has direct effects at the core, the root of the tooth, as well as the microbiome. Why do they have rheumatism? Why do they fall down? All of these things are things we thought were old people disease, but they all have a specific mechanism that interestingly is wrapped into all the things I just told you about of the suffering of the nervous system as you lose the D and the B vitamins. And many, many of these things are showing up in younger and younger and younger populations. That means they're affecting our children who also don't sleep normally as in epidemic proportions. Now, just to review those three steps, the brain runs the oral airway during sleep. Again, not to minimize the importance of what you guys do. Low D ruins the sleep and the raw microbiome ruins the sleep also. You'd like to get your patients sleeping better. This is a complex set of ideas. It is not easy. I have a workbook on my website that is meant for lay people to be their personal assistant to take them through this process over about a year and a half. I also have courses that are called Right Sleep for Clinicians that are meant to teach you how to use this safely and in the most intelligent way for your practice, um, either no matter what your practice is, um, the next one is November 12th and 13th. You can go to my website as uh, uh, Dr. Gomenak. So my website is drgomenak.com. You can also communicate with me if you'd like through my Yahoo account. Go to the four clinician menu tab to register for the course. It was my pleasure to be here and to introduce these ideas to you. I would welcome any questions at the question and answer period or through my email. And I hope that uh, you will continue to be interested in this topic. It definitely is um, one of the most important topics we're all dealing with now. Governor, and thank you very much for inviting me.